afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. One of the major issues being debated in the State House right now is water quality. Farm and urban runoff are among the variety of factors that negatively affect the water in our lakes, rivers, and streams. Farmers know they play a role in contributing to the problem, and as stewards of the land, they know they are also part of the solutions. Many farmers have already taken steps to maintain buffer zones between their fields and waterways as a way to reduce runoff. And now more farms are employing the practice of cover cropping. It's a tried and true technique that helps manage erosion and improve soil fertility. This past fall, as farmers prepared their fields for winter, a workshop in Westford spotlighted cover cropping. Keith Silva tells Tells us more. The general farming population is really trying to do the right thing. Once the corn has been chopped, farmers know winter won't be far behind. The rye was like, you could almost like, is that a weed coming? Almost like For Tony Pouliot, this winter is going to be a little like, different, nope, nope, that's a little so that greener. Second, and then the white Pouliot is growing cover crops. Shortly after his corn was cut, he planted ryegrass, radishes, turnip, and white clover. The results and the benefits of this technique are now starting to show. There's two major benefits to the cover crop. One is a stabilization of our soils. Don't lose what you got. And then on top of it, these plants are taking up nutrients that are in the soil. So next spring comes around, there's no let there's less volatilization, there's less precipitation, the, the nutrients are staying in the soil, they're staying in the plant. So next year, this stuff when we till it in is actually a natural fertilizer. If the ryegrass, most of the ryegrass seed was right here, it probably did compete pretty heavily. With Pouliot the, developed with his cover cropping plan in collaboration yeah. with the University of Vermont Extension's Northwest so Crops and Soils team. Together, the two are hosting a field day at Pouliot's that, farm uh, to share what they've learned. We have a broad range of folks that come to these field days. We have farmers that are really interested. Maybe they haven't started cover cropping and they really want to see what other farmers are doing. Because if, if their neighbor um, or really their colleague um, is, is cover cropping and they're having good success, then they'll likely try it too. So they're here on a fact-finding mission. And then there's other farms that are here that are already cover cropping and they're just interested to see what other people are doing. Maybe they're doing something a little bit differently, trying a different species, a different method, and just um, really engaged in uh, trying to take cover cropping to a different level, maybe on their farm. Plant in a green crop. Puglia is a recent convert to cover cropping. He tried the technique before, but without any success. Inspired by a no-till conference he attended earlier this year, Pouliot made up his mind to give cover cropping well, another shot and asked UVM Extension for help. This time I sat down and I said, guys, let's give it the best chance we have. This is how I want to do it. Will it work? And they said, yes, let's do it this way, this way, this way. And here it is, UVM Extension. You get somebody like Heather and, and her staff. Two days we had it all figured out and it was spread. Without people like her that's had experience with this stuff, it's a shot in the dark. This utterly could have failed without somebody there saying, no, we've tried that. Don't use this. Try this instead. So you need somebody to shine a light in the direction you need to head, and then you need to go find the light switch and turn it on. When I started in extension in 2003, I can bring you to the one field in the county that was cover cropped. And I remember w talking to that farmer saying, why are you doing this? I want, I want to do this. I learned about this in college, you know? I want everybody to do this, but I, nobody's doing it. And why are you doing it? And now, you know, there's thousands of acres in cover cropping. Um, and that's really just changed over the last probably two, two years, two to three years. And that's really exciting because now when you drive through Vermont in the fall, you don't see a lot of brown fields where the corn's been removed, you see green, and, and they're not weeds growing. You know, they're a, a, a soil protector, a, you know, a crop, a crop, really, just a different kind. Just different and... So it'd it, be great if the whole field looked like this. Well, well next year it will. Cover crops protect a farmer's most valuable asset, their soil. They also have an extra benefit of being a colorful addition to public relations. So when I look at this, I don't necessarily see money spent. I love the green, I love the color. So when I look across this field, I see a living thing. And the green adds to the living. 
I do feel that uh, people initially started cover cropping because of, of the pressure uh, from, from the public um, and also from regulatory agencies to, um, to reduce erosion coming out of uh, cornfields. And, um, and really that's probably where it started. And, uh, but now we have farmers looking at this from a much different perspective, a much broader perspective of um, cover crops are really helping us. And, and they offer us so much. How do we implement them uh, to our advantage from both an economic advantage, there's a lot, a lot of economic gains with cover cropping from yield gains to fertility, um, to added feed. And um, how do we make that work in our advantage? What do we do? What are the best practices to use? So, so they're much more sophisticated and much more sophisticated questions than where we were probably five years ago, where people were just maybe doing it for one reason. This is all what I call minimum tillage. This was, we till the top for now, Tony Pouliot is done harvesting corn. And as for next year's more. crop, well, he already has that covered. In Westford, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thank you, Keith. Our next segment also deals with plants, but this time we're talking about dried plants. One of the best known secrets at the University of Vermont is the Pringle Herbarium. The herbarium is a fully functional collection of more than 300,000 specimens of dried plants. What's so significant about dried plants and what makes UVM's Pringle Herbarium so important? Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin has the story. Wes Testo doesn't have time to stop and smell the flowers. He's too busy collecting them. You ideally want not just leaves, but either flowers or fertile leaves if it's a fern, which I often work with, or fruits, often bark of a tree, something like that. Additional characters that can really help you identify it and would also be useful to someone, you know, 50 or 100 years down the road who'd come and look at this plant because these specimens, you know, outlast the people who collect them. Testo takes notes detailed notes about, about how and where the plant is growing and arranges it in his press. Drying um, plants as quickly as possible is key to keeping their color and preventing rot. You flatten the whole plant out, um, but you need to do so in a way that presents all of the possible important features of the plant. So you want the flowers to be presented, um, the roots, if you're collecting the roots, to be presented. Um, both sides of leaves, so people can see the undersides and the top sides of leaves. Testo will contribute his findings to one of the largest collections of dried plants in New England, which is located at the University of Vermont. The first person we know about who collected plants, who was connected with the University of Vermont, was a man named Joseph Torrey, who coincidentally also got his name on the building we're in. Dave Barrington is a professor of plant biology at UVM and the curator of the Pringle Herbarium, which is home to over 300,000 specimens of preserved plants. And the primary goal of having the collection is to provide a basis for research into biodiversity, conservation of that diversity, and then various studies of what we call systematic biology, which is understanding kinds of plants and animals, the way they originated through the evolutionary process. While Tori's collection of plants from the 1840s marks the start of the herbarium, what really galvanized the collection was the acquisition of the private herbarium of Charlotte Cyrus Pringle in 1902. And Cyrus is perhaps the most colorful person in the history of the collection. At the time that his collection came to the university, he had in his own house in Charlotte, about 50,000 specimens. We're in the fern part of the collection right now, and I open it up, and what I've got here is something like a couple of thousand specimens, each in their folders. The collection here grows through gifts and acquisitions of smaller herbaria, as well as trading duplicates of specimens with other institutions. We have some really exotic trading relationships. We have trading relationships with a group in northeastern Brazil, uh, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, uh, a couple of places in Europe, um, the herbarium in Denmark trades us Greenland specimens, and we trade with herbaria here and there across the United States as well. 
In addition, the Pringle relies on botany enthusiasts to help grow and round out their collection of local plants. Barrington says those collectors include conservationists and hobbyists, as well as students like Testo, who's working towards a PhD in plant biology. I do a lot of collecting for the herbarium, um, so I started that pretty seriously a little over a year ago when I moved to Vermont. Um, and so I go out in the field quite frequently and collect plants mostly for my own research. So ferns that I am studying, I collect those, um, take a leaf or a whole plant, press it and dry it, um, and deposit those in the herbarium for my own study. But I also am um, broadly interested in the plants that we have here in Vermont. So I collect a lot of those as well, try to learn to identify them. Herbaria collections not only document the plant life within a geographic area, but also help researchers identify the arrival of invasive species. When you collect a plant, you include the date on when you collected it. For example, Japanese knotweed is a really prominent weed that we have in the state. That wasn't here 50 years ago. Now it's all over our roadsides. Um, so if you go to an herbarium and start to look at collections, you can start to kind of infer when this plant showed up on the scene here. So it looks After the plants dry, Testo will hand them over to the Pringle, um, where they will eventually be mounted. When they are, there's a good chance that it will be done by Hilda White. Newspaper over it. And the plants come sure from all the over the world. Plant this plant is from Italy. We have a collector who's collected a lot from Australia and Illinois and everywhere. And we have uh, many Vermont collectors, so our collection of Vermont plants is outstanding. White has and been I'm a volunteer at the Pringle nice since 1998. She's mounted over 30,000 plants for the collection. What is it that makes a good specimen? Well, see this one? It has flowers, and roots, and it's pressed nicely so that it, it shows up properly. The, uh, the flowers, the reproductive parts always have to be up so that a scientist that's examining this later can tell what's, what it is. And um, they need to be dried fresh and properly. If they're not dried properly, they come out black instead of green. Like many who volunteer or spend time working at the Pringle, White is also an avid plant collector. Her passion is mosses. Every year I go out to one or two towns and collect mosses. I've gone mostly to towns that have not been recorded very much because we really didn't know whether something was rare or not just because nobody collected it. And, and so for entertainment in the wintertime. I identify these mosses that I, that I collect. Once the specimens are mounted, they're filed into the large cabinets that hold the collection. As those cabinets are organized by botanical family in evolutionary order, proper filing is a task that might require a degree in botany just to figure out. So this is one specimen, and this is what we have 300,000 of. Uh, as long as we can keep the insects from eating it, and fire from burning it, uh, storage is indefinite. We have specimens in European area that are now 600 years old, and they're fine. You see these plants every day. It's nice to be able to know what the difference is between an oak tree and a maple tree, or between all the different kinds of maples that we have. But you really start to get a grasp for the diversity around you. Um, so instead of just seeing a whole bunch of green around you, you start to see different grasses and plantains and asters and wild impatiens growing. The Pringle Herbarium continues to grow and expand, an old-fashioned catalog of the world around us that remains relevant in our modern times. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. There are ongoing efforts to digitize the herbarium specimens and data. A significant portion of the collections are already part of an online database. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.